face of London is changing as never before in all its 2,000 years of history. The best of the past stands proudly amid the vanishing ruins of the outdated and the unwanted. The citizens of tomorrow watch the world of their grandfathers swept away. Like some medieval battering ram, the captive cannonball batters at the wall. part of yesterday crumbles into dust, that yesterday is so sadly out of date with the changing needs of London. Only the ruins to remind us of what once stood here, and soon they will be gone, leaving only the history books to tell of the constantly changing pattern of a great city. The door into the past is closing, but before it shuts, we must learn the lesson it can teach. London grew like some haphazard children's game, street by street, district by district, following little or no plan save the expediency of the moment. The buildings crowded one upon the other, and in this vast conglomeration of a city, men lived and earned their livelihood. The dust and smoke that earned their bread became their daily diet. Factories were built with little thought for comfort, narrow windows, little light, machinery and men restricted by the same cramped quarters. The outdated, the unwanted, the tired buildings of the past leveled to the ground, and in their place, the new face of London. This is the London we are building, and to see the future of their city, Londoners are looking upward. It's more than a new pastime, it's a habit. You can't stop yourself looking up. And what is taking place in London is in many ways a reflection of what is happening throughout Britain. After centuries of building on the horizontal plane, London is going vertical. What a contrast they make with the ornate facades created by Victorian architects. A fascinating contrast between their obsession for the decorative and today's quest for crisp clean, functional design. The Thames, silent witness to all of London's past, sees a new dramatic skyline arising along its banks. The river has brought trade to London, giving her the wealth which made her great, and her leadership in commerce is reflected in her prosperous new buildings. It's little short of a renaissance, for the world of commerce is forsaking its Dickensian past, those quaint but dismal business houses in the city. For the millions who daily flock to work in inner London, this renaissance means less crowded, more congenial surroundings. Ever-expanding trade demands increased staff, and the emphasis is turning to larger firms which can afford to build in proportion to their size. They have changed the skyline of a city the most dramatic new horizon since St. Paul's. The city is the oldest part of London,
strange that here the greatest changes should take place. But the city was severely damaged during the war, and these new buildings are as much the outcome of necessity as choice. The opportunity was given us to build anew. Among the treasures of the city still left to us are the wonderful churches designed by Sir Christopher Wren. Their preservation is an important task. This one was damaged by bombing, but carefully, stone by stone, the restorers are at work. This modern office block makes strange company as the Wren church rises once again in the shadow of his greatest masterpiece, St. Paul. St. Paul's, the heart of the city, surrounded and suffocated for years. Now, instead of buildings cluttering up the view, gardens with space and open air, and for the thousands of workers in the nearby buildings, a lunchtime oasis, serenity and sandwiches. The lunchtime date. A place for a chat. A place to sit in peace, if you can. An interesting aspect of the new design for London is the use of new materials and construction techniques. Skeletons of concrete and steel are now almost commonplace, and they have become the key to the new elevations of our buildings. New techniques have given the architect more freedom. One of his aims is to bring more light into his buildings. The use of glass for walls as well as windows is a revolution in technique. Architecture is entering the glass age. What can be achieved by these modern methods? This extraordinary model is an impression of a community of the future that could be built today, involving no constructional techniques other than those currently in use. Its designers have christened it Motopia. All the roads are at roof level above the flats which are insulated for sound and vibration. Will the London of the future ever look like this? Who can tell? Well, let's take a look at some of the projects which have actually been adopted for London. The London County Council, from its headquarters at County Hall, has devised a development plan which is intimately concerned with the changing face of London. The plan covers 117 square miles, from Hammersmith in the west to Poplar in the east, from Hampstead in the north to Crystal Palace in the south. It is the first authoritative plan to be applied to so large an area of London. The policy is to coordinate the various development schemes, private and public, and to ensure that the interests of the people who live and work in London are not forgotten. Besides giving its sanction to all building schemes within its domain, the Council is busy with numerous projects of its own. These are the people who have to work out the varied and often conflicting needs of London, the fairest and best use of available land and the size and relationships of buildings. The planner focuses the picture for the whole team of technical experts. The next stage concerns the planning of individual areas. Drawings and scale models are made and remade until they are right as a whole and in their details. The architect must translate abstract ideas and practical requirements into a concrete plan. Literally concrete in the case of many blocks of flats helping to solve the capital's housing problem. Now how big is this problem? After the war it was estimated that to meet the housing needs of London County a quarter of a million new houses would have to be provided and that was only a beginning. Now let's see some of the variety of projects underway. This model shows the building scheme for one of the oldest and busiest areas of South London, the Elephant and Castle. Another vast development plan, this time on the site of the once famous Crystal Palace. It's a gigantic sports centre in the Olympic style and will cost over two million pounds. It's an ambitious plan to provide a central home for British amateur sport. It has facilities for every type of sport and is complete with its own hostel of unusual design.
The new Commonwealth Centre that is shortly to be built will serve as an ever-changing exhibition reflecting every aspect of Commonwealth life today. This model of a new school underlines a tremendously important aspect of the plan. That is, to give our children advantages their parents hardly dreamed of. To give them a more imaginative environment for learning. In the new London, the planners are helping to encourage the vitality of youth. Not smother it with those bleak, inhospitable surroundings that used to be known as school. This is surely the most exciting advance in the history of education. And it's one of the most vital features of our rebuilding plan. These days, everyone is talking about education, and technical schools in particular. Here are some recent designs. Proposals for London's 20-year education plan called for more school and college buildings of all kinds. Education is a priority in the overall development plan, so that new schools are already prominent in the pattern of the new London. The housing programme is a no less impressive aspect of New London. 125,000 new dwellings have been completed in the County of London alone since the war. They replace the thousands destroyed by the war. They reduce overcrowding and they supersede the slums and the old outdated buildings with something so much more worthwhile. A new design for living. What a challenge to our creative skill. With the passing of old London, a way of life is passing too. Our demands for entertainment are now on a more ambitious scale. Television makes its powerful impact on our skyline. This gigantic BBC television studio is the largest in Europe. This building plan is a young plan, and it's largely for the young that it's designed. Proper playgrounds instead of only streets to play. That's one of the first things we owe our children. The last house in the street. Soon it will be gone. Behind it, new flats will make so much better use of the restricted living space, providing clean, compact, labour-saving homes. Naturally, the older generation often regards this revolution with a certain apprehension. Sentiment is very strong in Londoners. With all its faults, this was her hope. This street, the hub of her whole life. Now, it has gone. For a moment, she lives with her memories. But for her and others like her, the changing face of London means a better, a richer life. Fresh awareness of the needs of old age is reflected in the new designs for old people's homes, so that they too can share the benefits of the new London. How different from an institution is this community of old folk? And how different the London of their youth from the London of today. Londoners are taking an interest in the changing face of their city as never before. And never before have the planners been so aware of public opinion. For instance, Piccadilly Circus has few merits architecturally, but to millions of Londoners and visitors, little less than sacred. Great changes are going to take place. Public inquiries have been held to consider various schemes, and to say that opinions are divided is an understatement. This model shows an early stage in the working out of an overall plan for the future of the circus, including redesigned roadways to help the traffic flow. From Poplar to Chelsea, from Finsbury to Lambeth, the new London is taking shape. A long job and a very costly one. By 1972, the London County Council and other public bodies alone will have spent approaching 1,000 million pounds. Upon the shoulders of the planners, the architects, the builders, lies an enormous responsibility. 
Before them, they face a gigantic task. The are as yet but at the beginning. As Britain's capital city and the centre of the Commonwealth, London's efficiency in the commercial and economic fields is of far-reaching significance. Their efficiency can only be achieved by remodelling those features which are out of date. For the men concerned, it's often just another job. But each one is taking part in a historic undertaking. It affects the lives of millions of people. It's the greatest rebuilding programme in the history of London. We are making London a better place to live in, to grow up in, to grow old in, a better place. And while building for the future, we must preserve the best of London's yesterday, that tradition of fine buildings which is at the heart of this great city's character. They are the living link between the city's past and our endeavour for its future. They are the foundations upon which we build the new London.